I'll introduce our next speaker. Uh, Mike Doherty uh, has been a guest at the Bloggers Briefing in the, in the past. He is a small business owner from, uh, from Atlanta who uh, created a cancer detection center um, in Atlanta uh, called LabMD. And then about four years ago, uh, ran into uh, to some trouble with a, uh, with a private enterprise and then the government scheming to, uh, to do a whole variety of things that he's chronicled in a, in a new book, which you uh, see up on the screen there, The Devil Inside the Beltway. Uh, Mike was uh, a guest at, uh, at Heritage's Resource Bank Conference and has been talking to several folks uh, in, in the building and wanted to bring him here today uh, to give you a uh, preview. The book will be out later this summer and in front of you you have some, uh, some nice candy that's uh, been generous, generously donated on Mike's behalf <laughs> for, for dessert today. So, so Mike, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Hi. Um, that actually is, is the promo that we use, this box of Mike and Ike's with the cover on it. And in a quick blurb, we uh, did a uh, pu publishing trade launch in New York City at BEA, and that went over quite well. <clears throat> you will see that the subtitle has been changed to surveillance from extortion, thanks to Mr. Snowden and the media, and we thought it was a much more timely. So finally, we felt the had that aha moment. So uh, that's almost accurate. Uh, there's also an Indiegogo campaign that's going to be launching in about a week and a half, and the link to that is there. <coughs> so uh, thanks for um, your attention. Um, I am I am a small business owner from Atlanta. LabMD does cancer detection for uh, the urology market space for prostate cancer and bladder cancer. Uh, we have 25 employees. We have uh, urology offices around the country. And we're a very small niche player. Um, I've been working in medicine since I was out of college. I went to Michigan, and uh, my background's in economics, but I've always worked in surgery and, and started this company in 1996. Just wanted to have a small, private, very well-run uh, medical facility and we were doing quite well. This story is really a trifecta of uh, beating up small business, government surveillance, and government overreach. And uh, uh, the, in the book, there are really three antagonists. Uh, the private enterprise academia team of Tyversa and Dartmouth, uh, Homeland Security and FTC in the government, and then the big DC law firm mentality. And, and I tell the, the story, uh, I, 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 I write the book in a narrative nonfiction story because the book really is for the grassroots Americans to understand what, what happens in a very detailed way, but hopefully a compelling way. So it's really not, um, it's, it's written, I, I talked to a lot of thriller writers, uh, fiction writers actually, about how to communicate effectively and bring the reader in. So while hopefully it's very in appealing to people inside the Beltway or people in cybersecurity or medicine, really it's, it, I, I, I'm, I'm ideally trying to educate everyone in an extremely transparent way, seeing myself as the conduit, not the center of the story, about this is just one example of, of how, how the wheels can come off the cart. Um, the story did start in 2008. We got a phone call from, uh, we literally, I mean, it is like out of a movie. We got a phone call from uh, the president uh, and, and, or the CEO of Tyversa. His name's Robert Bobek. He said he had uh, downloaded our file off of a peer-to-peer -peer network. It had, uh, uh, would, uh, would he, he, we liked us to hire him to remediate it. Uh, we asked him to prove exactly what happened, and uh, he would prove that he had it. Uh, in a continual series of very transparent emails that are on the book for nice, juicy storytelling. Uh, he uh, didn't give us any information unless we hired him, which I wouldn't do. So we went out and immediately pulled in the lawyers and our own IT people, and, and we, we still to this day in 2013 have never found our file out in cyberspace. Um, that was, uh, you know, when you're running a medical facility and you're working medicine, these side flies in the ointments, I mean, all I wanted to do was make sure that our, our, our patients were safe. And then we moved on. But he didn't want to move on unless we hired him. And so we finally told him just to go away and only contact our lawyer. And in the end of 2008, we got a phone call from his lawyer saying that they were giving this to the Federal Trade Commission. They didn't want to be sued. I didn't know quite what to do with that. And um, so I didn't do anything with it. What am I supposed to do? So in, two th uh, in 2009, it was very quiet. We continually looked for the file. We had this eerie what-if feeling. And, uh, and we never found any evidence. And uh, so in 2010, uh, we got a, a phone call from uh, an investigator at the Federal Trade Commission saying that he's, uh, the file has come into their possession. 
and uh, we'll be getting a letter to for a non-public inquiry. And all these meaningless words at the time have great meaning to me now, non-public inquiry. And so I expect, okay, we, we've worked with the feds for 15 years. They come in every year. They inspect us. We get along great. Everyone learns from each other. It's not like an IRS audit. We, we, every, it's a great, no problem. That shattered. Very quickly when we, um, we, we transparently dumped 5,000 pages of our entire system on them and, and our phone calls morphed into um, you're not answering our questions. Uh, we can understand how we can possibly answering the, these eight page single space letters that had all these questions in it with everything that we had. And our, naiv our naivete pretty much shattered when we were asked to come to DC and we had a very chilling meeting that, that again, I kept thinking, this is, this is not happening. This is like a movie. These people are, are I mean, I felt like I was on an episode of, of, of you know, CSI or something, like we had committed some sort of murder. And um, we were getting no information back. So um, at that point, I had, um, learned that this wasn't going to go away just by being fully cooperative and that the, the what I consider the DC law firm mentality, not every lawyer in the world, but not every DC law firm, but everyone that I was encountering was pretty much leapfrogging what really went on and just going settle, settle, settle. This is an agency bigger than you could ever know to deal with. You're going to lose no matter what. Just make them go away. So I thought there might be some wisdom in that, even though I thought it was terrible. I had a company to run. And we tried to give them what they want for the next year. But at the same time, at that point, I realized that no one is going to come to my rescue or my company's rescue except me. So I turned into an investigative reporter. And I discovered um, uh, hearings a a in 2007 in front of Oversight that had uh, Tyversa and uh, Dartmouth and the FTC and Wesley Clark saying, talking about the the uh, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, leaks uh, of of military secrets and and, um, and all these uh, vulnerabilities that we have. You might remember, and I think it was 08 or 09, they, the Obama's helicopter plans got out and there were hidden things. There was all sorts of things that were that they were discovering. They found plans on an Iranian computer in any way. And, but I, I, was, I was learning that there really was some connection here, that here's all these people that I'm involved with, and they're all sitting there at the same desk in front of Congress, you know, a year before I even got a phone call, and three years before I discovered what's going on. So the hindsight's 2020. It's all coming into play. One of the things I found was this press release from Tyversa that said, um, Tyversa is performing an ongoing study uh, who's pati with patient-pending technology monitoring 450 million users, issuing more than 1.5 billion searches per day. And I find out that, uh, and, and this isn't chronological discovery, but for the sake of the book, I'm just going to sum this up. But what I essentially found out was that, that Wesley Clark and Howard Schmidt, who for a while was Obama's head of cybersecurity, are on the advisory council for Tyversa. And somehow these guys got in front of Congress, and, and Dartmouth got a $24 million uh, partially funded grant from Homeland Security. And they were going out and surveilling, as he said, uh, 450 million users. And they downloaded 13 million files in this release from May of 2009. One of which, I'm the lucky one of 13 million. What are the odds of my sitting here? Hmm? So <laughs> and what are the, as my lawyer said, and what are the odds of them picking you? <laughs> so, um, so, so the story is about that awakening and discovery, and it moves from, you know, that one random phone call to, um, to discovering the government involvement, the FTC investigation, how they wouldn't go away, the tactics of the FTC. Um, they threatened to sue continually. Um, they never did. They still say I'm under investigation. We went to court. It's just a, it's just a, a long, head-shaking um, chron chronology of, 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 of how this is how they do it, so to speak. And, uh, and I bring all those machinations to light. I don't know if there's any, that's probably the fastest well, summary I, I can do. Well, I was going to ask you, what, where does the business stand today? I mean, um, well, the business, this, this is the biggest, you know. <laughs> um, the bi luckily, on the one hand, we survive. I have a phenomenal staff of very loyal people, that, so we are alive. 
um, we have been annihilated in opportunity cost. All our plans in 2009, 2010 to get in breast pathology, breast care, um, molecular, that all got sideswiped. Um, and when you're a small company anyway, you have to wear a million hats, and we did not. And I suddenly, I have now have where all that all that focus that went to that growth went then to survival. Uh, and then went to um, in-house law firm. I mean, basically, I had to stop the bleeding. So instead of using outside law firms, I have in-house lawyer, Lexus, Nexus, paralegal. So um, that's you know we're treading water, uh, and for, we we were debt-free and profitable. Um, and for the first time, 2013, we started losing money. Um, so, but you know, I I I. <laughs> As a CEO of a company, I, I see this book as, as many things. It, it, is, it is an education piece primarily because I'm a conduit of this, and I'm in that position where I can tell this story. Um, and I think most people that are in, in my situation cannot. Um, but at the same time, it's also um, kind of a Hail Mary pass to, to save the company because we say now we have the medical subsidiary and we have the publishing subsidiary. So, but that's where, where we're at. But, and the other side of the coin I'll tell you is um, to work in medicine right now and to be upset with the government is a really good spot. We've had nothing but support from all our physicians um, because the press, I never told anyone, even my family, till last October. I mean, five people on the planet knew about this till last, I mean, yeah. October of 2012. And, um, but then the press broke it when the FTC sued me last summer to sit for a CID. They didn't sue over this yet, but they sued me to, to sit for a CID, and then the press discovered it and did a pretty good job. And the U.S. Chamber wrote about it. And so, uh, you know, then you find out what's going to happen. And so far, it's been a really um, an educational great run. So, questions for Mike? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You got it. Well, the irony about this is that we have, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I, with a foundation sales, I'll tell you, I always think if it comes out of my mouth, that can be doubted, but be that as it may, we've always had great security. And we especially know this because w the differentiation of our company is the technology that we would install in our physician's offices so they communicate with us well. And we knew what we'd go into because we have an interface with all these physicians' offices. Um, and, and, we, and then, because the FTC has no standards, which is such a big part of this book, by the way, is this making the law up as they go along, really ignoring Congress, not just uh, you know, apologizing later, and, and the power they have that got pretty much every company they went after to roll over until they ran to me, I guess, and win them right now, um, is is, is just, uh, we, w there was no market for this. I mean, we, we had to go pay for a, a security company that dealt, deals with medium and huge businesses, and they had to do some special deal because there's really no, um, no big security firms that would come in. But we, we went into overkill with no, um, you know, with no, mark, no suppliers out there and created, a, and a supplier did create a product for us, basically, you know, created a price point for us. You know, they didn't, they didn't have anything for under 100 users or 200, you know, 500 users, actually. But anyway, if that answers your question. So, you know, it is very important for me to, to get across that, that we, to this day, don't feel like our file ever got out. That, that through that testimony, which is, which is in the appendix of the book, and, and using their words under oath in front of Congress, not mine, that, that they have a unique technology that they go and surveil and, and try to find what's quote unquote vulnerable. And to, to define what is vulnerable on the internet right now is, is, I mean, we're much more educated about this in 2008, but even your power strip can make you vulnerable. So, um, you know, there is, a, there's, um, you know, we're, I'm, we don't even believe that there was a breach. We believe that in, in the legal sense, a breach is a loss of your file to a trusted source. And we believe our file is at Diversa, Dartmouth, and the Feds. And uh, so, so, uh, you know, I hope that answers your question about security, but we're extraordinarily confident. But we were before, you know? Ramon. Sure. Um, as a policymaker, I mean, this is, a, this is a horrible example of the government going wrong, and it's certainly not unique. Right. My question is, what can uh, members of Congress do to solve this problem, to, to make sure this kinds of thing doesn't happen? What about... Um, and I don't know what the who we have over at the FTC if there's anybody left. What can that what can be done there to solve the problem? Uh, what are the what are the policies we need so that this sort of persecution 
doesn't doesn't happen. Again. Well. I mean, if you tell me six months ago, I'd be sitting here talking about this and surveillance of the people. But until six months ago, or even the Snowden thing, our biggest battle was this story seems over the top. It, it's it's like entertainment, but who really believes it? Which is why I have it so documented. I, it's painfully documented so that people can understand it. It's not to take my word for it. Now, that seems to be not that large of a hurdle to jump over. But I think the big picture is Congress has got to control government agencies. The self-policing and self-regulatory stuff is is, is way, way more too naive and am ambitious. I mean, the human condition is not going to allow anyone with power this much of unregulated power, I don't care what your political persuasion is, to, to run amok. And, and they do it, I mean, we've got all these, we've got the, I mean, what convincing do we need? We've got the Internal Revenue Service. We've got the EPA. What, what do these, those people did to, the, to those people in Montana with a 9-0 Supreme Court vote. How many of those do we get? We've got the Federal Trade Commission. I mean, you know, and the big picture is, and I talk about this at the end of the book, and I get pretty wonky about the, the branches of government, the, the, the executive branch, the, the judicial, uh, the legislative, the walls melting, the, the Supreme Court really tying up the executive branch's power on getting rid of some of these agency heads. And, then, and that combined with then the judicial branch kind of going, well, it's Congress made the law, and then Congress says, well, you know, we'll just make this lousy law. It's this mess. <laughs> you know, it is a mess of, of, of finger pointing. And Rausch, actually, who just resigned um, as one of the commissioners and was the only commissioner that dissented on going forward with us, um, it's talked about finger pointing between the executive branches and controlling government agencies. I mean, this is a bigger picture than the FTC. This is government agencies. I mean, this self-policing, creating an agency, letting them do the dirty work has just got to stop because th this carnage is all coming up all at once. And I'm just one example of it. So I think Congress is ultimately going to have to wake up. And, and, and just and take some control here. And, and the Supreme Court's got to quit with these rulings like Humphreys from the 30s that just allow these things to run amok and, and, and don't smack them down. They give huge, the courts give huge deference to government agencies. And in the mountain, in the, the, at one of the chapters at the end of the book is called uh, This Long Climb Up Justice Mountain. And the amount of money you have to spend just to get the attention of, of this complicit <laughs> crowd is 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 really unbelievable. So I, I don't I, I, I think it really boils down to uh, grassroots understanding and Congress getting their act together. If that answers your question, <laughs> something simple. <laughs> yeah. um, well, actually, you just talked about something that I think is one of the biggest problems is the Congress delegates too much power to agencies, and then the Supreme Court is basically killed the non-delegation doctrine, basically making it possible for Congress to delegate whatever lawmaking power to essentially the agencies, and they can do what they want, and then courts deferring to the agencies. So agencies are running amok, plus you combine FTC being an independent agency, makes things really impossible. But the question is, what, what specific law are they saying that you violated, <laughs> and what, what, what resolution are they seeking? Well, this is the perfect example. <laughs> it's called the rubber band of the law, and it's Section 5 of the FTC Commission, of, of Federal Trade Commission the Act, that says that the, basically their job is to go and uh, police any type of unfairness or deception. So they are allowed to identify unfairness. Now, we are a medical laboratory, so our patients come in in tubes. So there's no deception, per se. We don't have ad sheets and all that stuff. Um, and and it's, it's, it does not, it, it just, to this day, through all this I've been through, I still can't believe they're doing this to cancer detection lab. I mean, these people are just robotic. <laughs> but, but um, and, and the, the, the unfairness part is this subjective, subjective law. So you've got this perfect storm of these legal terms. You've got unfairness, which is subjective. That's like saying being pretty is legal or illegal. Uh, you've, got, you've got then the court saying, well, they just have to have a plausible reason. They just have to have a reason. You've got rulings in the, when, when the, the federal judge, I, I intentionally have fought the FTC every step of the way. I have thrown everything they throw at me, I throw it right back. We're going to court to decide what, what, the, what the name of the day is. And so when it got in front of the judge, I actually won the judge lottery, and Judge Duffy in Atlanta said to them, you know, this hearing is about if you can make him sit. 
And in his ruling, he said, basically, government agencies can, can make people sit for interviews out of curiosity, thanks to court rulings. And, but that doesn't mean they can do this if they get to the point of the next hearing that would be to actually enforce something. But look at the damage done just on the road to a decision. And how many people have enough blood in their body to make it to the finish line? I mean, I just was in this fortunate spot where I've got phenomenal support from clients, and I'm private. I don't have you know a bunch of shareholders, and they were, and and I really say I had two lousy choices: death or chronic disease. If I signed a consent decree and said that my day's security practices are lousy, and the whole world thinks they are, then because who reads the bottom line that says no, nothing's been admitted, you know? No one admits any wrongdoing. Versus fighting them, which is like the chronic disease, I'd rather take the chronic disease. Because what they want to do is the government agency doesn't want to get to court. That's where accountability lies. They want, it, they want you to see this big road to get to court, and they want you to settle beforehand by then saying, OK, I'll let you audit me for 20 years. So they wanted me to let them audit me for 20 years at my own expense, which then would open me to fines and everything else. I mean, both solutions were, were nightmares. So I just, took my, I just took my pain up front. And I tried to make it a huge positive through writing the book. And it had, I mean, I have to tell you, I don't, don't, they got no credit for this, but this has been a really life-changing, very positive event, because here I sit, you know? Or, and, I, and I've met senators, and you know, it's been, it's been an amazing ride. I've got huge support from NFIBs here. Um, and, you know, and I think it's important that we let people understand that this is just one example. And, and I see myself as one of, one person that could actually have the circumstance to stand up versus 100 to 200 that can't. Um, I do want to tell you that Josh Wright, to answer your other question though, has is, is become the latest commissioner and he is quite, uh, quite aggressive in this. And I do think that Josh Wright understands this. Um, and uh, he replaced Rosh, and right now we have four commissioners, another one coming because Liv Woods um, um, resigned. Mike, so. one final thing. Um, can you tell us about the Indiegogo campaign oh, yeah. and what, what we can do to So um, you all have my card, which has got my real life on the back, and, and really, you guys, bloggers and the media are my grassroots fundamental. I am totally an open vein for you all. Uh, we are, the book's going to come out in September. We're starting Indiegogo campaign. It was actually supposed to launch this week, but we have found, we are working with a nonprofit, and we'll know in a couple days, but next week it probably, it will launch next week, but next week it's being delayed because it'll probably be tax deductible. Everything that you get on the Indiegogo would be tax deductible. So there'll be e-books, hardcover books, paperbacks, signed books, speaking engagements, all sorts of stuff that people can get from, from 15 bucks to 5,000. And uh, and all, and so uh, you know I'm trying to light a fire in the medical community, the cybersecurity world, small business world, uh, and everyone in politics and government about this story. And 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 the timing of this is crazy. I want to say that he, he, I'm sorry I forgot your name, but you asked me a question earlier about Snowden, Randy. And I would say that you know the difference here is Snowden went in and took, but the government came out and took mine. This is an inverse, you know, and, and I'm not running off to Iceland, so. <laughs> so, you know, this is, the, this story is bigger than, oh, every time the government surveils, it must be on national security, because this time we're talking about a cancer detection center and a private agency doing it with funding from Homeland Security. So, thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Thanks.